I am Dr. Fred Southwick, Professor of Medicine and author of Infectious Diseases, a Clinical Short Course. And today I want to review with you the key facts about community-acquired pneumonia. My goal is to provide you with information you will require to understand and manage this common and potentially life-threatening infection. Our module on community-acquired pneumonia, CAP, will consist of four short instructional videos. Each will be less than 10 minutes in duration. The first video will be covering the epidemiology and pathogenesis of community-acquired pneumonia. The second video will cover the clinical manifestations and discuss how to assess the severity of a patient's illness. And the third will discuss how to diagnose this infection and finally, the fourth video will cover treatment and prevention. These recommendations are based on the Infectious Disease Society of America IDSA guidelines. Before we discuss the epidemiology and pathogenesis of pneumonia, a few words of warning. This is a serious infectious disease that requires your deep understanding so that you can act quickly. You won't have time to read over your notes. You must develop long-term memories that will allow you to manage these patients in a timely manner because a delay in antibiotic treatment increases the risk of a fatal outcome. Community-acquired pneumonia is one of the most frequent infections you will encounter. In the United States, two to three million cases are reported each year. This infection accounts for over 10 million physician visits, 500,000 hospitalizations, and 45,000 deaths per year. Each year, 258 per 100,000 people require hospitalization in the United States. And statistics in other countries demonstrate similar high rates of illness due to pneumonia. This infection tends to be seasonal, occurring most frequently in the winter months. In order to survive, Humans possess a number of mechanisms to prevent bacteria and viruses from entering the, entering the lung. First are the nasal turbinates. They contain mucus and hairs that trap particles. Second, and one of the most important defense mechanisms, is the epiglottis. This tissue flap lies over the trachea, preventing food and fluid intended to enter the esophagus from reaching the trachea. If there is any dysfunction of the epiglottis, we all have accidentally inhaled some water or food at one time or another, we have a powerful cough reflex that expels this unwanted foreign material. In addition to our cough, our trachea and bronchi are lined with mucin-secreting epithelial cells. On the surface of these cells, there is mucin that traps the bacteria and viruses. These cells also have beating cilia on their surface. The cilia act as a conveyor belt and move the sticky mucus upward toward the pharynx. If bacteria manage to bypass all of these protective mechanisms and reach the alveoli, macrophages and neutrophils uh, combined with complement and immunoglobulins can ingest and kill these invading pathogens. Given these robust defenses, why is pneumonia so common? There are several ways that bacteria and viruses can enter the lung. Probably most common is aspiration of bacteria through the mouth while sleeping or as a consequence of sedation. The second mechanism is inhalation of micro droplets, often produced by coughing by another person who has developed an upper respiratory tract infection. Where do most of the bacteria and viruses come from? Predominantly, the nasopharyngeal flora, less commonly via micro droplets from other infected people. This mechanism of entry is most common for viruses and tuberculosis. Less commonly, dust particles can be inhaled. Desert areas and areas undergoing construction are most common. The pathogens carried in the dust 
are predominantly fungi, histoplasma, cryptococcus, and coccidioides, and the bacteria nocardia, found in moist soil. Water droplets produced by air conditioners and shower heads can be contaminated with Legionella and result in pneumonia. When acquiring a history, it is important to keep in mind specific risk factors that increase the risk of aspirating mouth flora. Pneumonia occurs most frequently during the winter because of the higher incidence of viral upper respiratory infections at that time of year. These infections result in increased production of nasal exudates that drain into the posterior nasopharyngeal space, particularly at night. The exudate may bypass the epiglottis, carrying the nasopharyngeal bacteria into the tracheobronchial tree. The major reason that el the elderly have such a high incidence of pneumonia is because with aging comes strokes and other neurological impairments that lead to swallowing and epiglottic dysfunction, increasing the risk of aspirating food, liquids, and nasopharyngeal exudate. Another major cause of epiglottis dysfunction is heavy alcohol ingestion, also anesthesia, particularly during dental procedures, and overuse of sedatives. Moving lower, dysfunction of the bronchial epithelial cells can also increase the risk of pneumonia. Smoking damages the cilia and results in thickened mucus that cannot be effectively transported by the cilia. Influenza virus also damages bronchoepithelial cells and their microcilia. Finally, patients who are immunocompromised, and this includes the elderly and other patients with chronic diseases, they have impaired production of immunoglobulins and reduced cell-mated immunity. I want to emphasize the high incidence of pneumonia among the elderly. One per hundred individuals over the age of 65 develop pneumonia each year. Not only this is a leading cause for their hospitalization, but also a leading cause of death. The most common bacteria to cause pneumonia is strep pneumoniae. Second is Haemophilus influenzae, followed by other gram-negative bacilli, including Legionella. Rounding out the most common pathogens are Chlamydophila, pneumoniae, mycoplasma, and Staph aureus. When bacteria enter the alveoli, they induce production of edema fluid that spreads to other alveoli through the pores of comb. Neutrophils quickly arrive to ingest the pathogens, and often red cells also leak into the site. Later, as the infection begins to be controlled, macrophages enter the site. Infection spreads outwardly. Imagine a fire spreading after a lightning strike. New regions of infection appear red, termed red hepatization, due to the infiltration of white cells and red cells. Older regions appear gray, gray hepatization, as the macrophages enter and clean up the red cells. Strep pneumonia does not contain proteases and therefore does not cause permanent pulmonary tissue damage. While Staph aureus and gram-negative bacilli produce proteases that break down tissue and cause permanent damage. Let me end this video with a summary. Pneumonia is common and potentially serious. The highest incidence in those is in those 65 or older and is one per hundred. Protective mechanisms include our nasal turbinates, epiglottis, cough, cilia, and mucus produced by bronchiopathial cells. Predisposing factors include viral URIs, being elderly, particularly after a stroke, heavy alcohol use, other sedatives, influenza, smoking, and immunocompromising illnesses. Strep pneumonia is the most common pathogen. When it enters the alveoli, it induces edema, fluid acutely associated with infiltration of neutrophils and red cells, followed by macrophages resulting in red, followed by gray hepatization. In our next video, we will be discussing the clinical presentation of pneumonia.